One of the joys of teaching is going on school trips. I can remember when I was teaching in Kent, going up to London to the theatre, and, and, and having, in a sense, a shepherding system where one of my colleagues would be at the front of the pack, and I normally found myself as whipper in at the back, trying to make sure that the, the flock had momentum to get into the theatre or to the station on time. It's even more exciting when you go on a, a residential trip, like I used to go on battlefields trips, and standing in the middle of Ypres when they'd been given free time and waiting for the flock to return. And in a sense, watching my colleagues and how they responded to those sheep that had become lost and not turned up at the appointed hour, hour and how quickly the boiling sensation came as they got angry with whoever it was that hadn't quite made it there on time. I have never stood in a field with a crook, a whistle and a dog to bring sheep in but I think my fairly limited teaching experience has given me an idea of what shepherding is all about. And for the Jews of old, of course, it was a really important picture. The image that David used in that psalm would resonate with the people. And we could almost suggest that in the passage that Ron read for us, that Jesus is almost bringing elements of the messianic to those words that David delivered long before. So we're going to think what it means when we talk of Jesus being the good shepherd, using some of the imagery from that passage that Ron read with some glances back at the psalm to help build yet another picture as part of this ongoing series of something of what we believe about Jesus, but more importantly about what Jesus offers to us as we continue along our pilgrim way. So what can we say? Firstly, that the good shepherd is not a hired hand. If to find a new minister, the circuit stewards had placed an advertisement in the local paper, laid down the terms and conditions, produced a nice shiny contract for someone to come and sign to take up the role here, you might not really get what you expected or indeed what you wanted. Ministers in our Methodist tradition don't apply for jobs. There is a discernment process that means that Andrew Webb is coming here because of what he offered and what the circuit would look for and people deciding there was a match there that was confirmed in a way by his visit and his recognising that this is the place for his uh, next period of ministry, however long that may be. It's a good system because it doesn't make it competitive. It allows for something of the, the movement of the spirit to ensure the right person is coming. Because a shepherd needs to have the right characteristics. Let's just pause and do a bit of an exegesis and understanding of Palestinian sheep. Because you need to get into your head that Palestinian sheep and not like the ones in the fields here about, which Ian is retired, that will have a more technical term for me, but, but British sheep tend to be quite skitty, bonkers and mad in my experience. Walk through a field and you will see something of that. Palestinian sheep are like your degree level sheep. Because when the shepherd calls, the sheep comes running. The idea of a dog or a whistle, or anything like that in Palestine, would be an anathema. So that you will see pictures, even today, of those who are looking after the sheep are small children. They don't need a grown man or woman to do it. The children do it because that voice recognition works, and the sheep, basically, are conformists. They do as they're told. They wouldn't survive long in Methodism, would they? So that that's how they react and respond but they still need a good shepherd. Because as the passage makes quite clear, hired hands don't work. Because for many of them, the first sign of trouble, and they will be gone. And your sheep will be left there at the mercy of the wolf or whatever it is that's coming. Just think of the David story. David 
was the shepherd. He was looking after the, the family flock. His brothers had gone to war to fight the Philistines. But he was on the hillside doing what generations of Israeli Palestinian boys have done. And that slingshot that he used would in a sense be part of the way in which he spent his time. Because if the wolf comes calling and you're looking after the family's wealth, you need something with which to get out of the way. And a well-aimed stone hitting the wolf somewhere would send it on its way. That shot that took Goliath down, as the story tells us, was not just a fluke. It was reflective of the experience that David would have gone through. And you can imagine little boys sitting there on the rocks, pinging their stones at various things to get their aim in to ensure that the family's wealth is protected. Good shepherds are a vital thing. Hired hands make life more difficult. The key to being a good shepherd is to care. It is as simple as that. It's there in the text that we have just heard. It's there, in a sense, in the picture that David delivers in that most beautiful of psalms. Jesus, in saying, I am the good shepherd, connects himself with the example of David, connects himself with a great story of faith, because shepherd pictures occur throughout the story of the Old Testament and into the new. It is a vital image so that yesterday people were out in town handing out sheep with a text of the story of the lost sheep to the people that they encountered to remind them in a way of how the good shepherd offers a place of security, a place where you know that you're at home, where you will be protected from whatever else comes, a place where you can sit and be. The challenge for us is to listen for the shepherd's voice, to seek to follow to the places where he calls in the hope of discovering those green pastures where we know life will be good. So the good shepherd is not a hired hand. Secondly, Jesus says of himself, I know my sheep and they know me. I think one of the worst things about being a minister is moving to a new appointment because you know you're going to have to learn a whole host of new names. There are those that are easy. Those who come week by week are relatively easy to pick up. Those who make the occasional guest appearance are much harder. The characters come to mind quite quickly. Those who are quiet and undemonstrative are a bit more of a challenge. And then there are those blessed souls who in spite of your best intentions, you cannot get their name to register in your mind and you have to work out how long it is when it becomes rude to keep asking them who they are and rely on others to remind you in the hope the name will eventually sink in. So you can think of Andrew when he comes and think of me when I, I move to Aylesbury and in a sense the importance for you of telling Andrew who you are. Until that point when he can call you by name. And then in a sense you see that picture that begins to suggest that he will be at home here. He will feel comfortable as he works out who you are and then has the fun of working out any interrelationships. And whether St Andrews, which it isn't, because this tends to be a smaller church thing, is a sort of church where if you, if you kick one, they all limp. <laughs> These things you need to work out, and that's part, in a sense, of immersing yourself and coming to the point where you become familiar. Jesus knew what it was to be a shepherd. My sheep know me, is a vital picture that is here. We part of the training of these young boys as they went out with elder siblings or with their father for the sheep to feel comfortable. Jesus says, I know my sheep. 
the Bible is full of intimate pictures of how well God knows us. That he can count the hairs on our head. That he knows our thoughts before we think them. He knows our comings in and our goings out. The Psalms in themselves are a rich place to discover something of the knowledge that we believe God has of us. And you can see that depth of knowledge in the way that Jesus relates to his disciples, be it Simon, Peter, James and John, or even Judas Iscariot. If you listen to the stories and try to get into your mind the reactions of the various personalities, you will see the depth of knowledge that Jesus had of those people. The knowledge that we believe that in some way he has of us. I know my sheep and they know me. I talked a couple of weeks ago of this thing I've been reading by Sarah Berry about following the Sermon on the Mount for a year and reflecting on its significant and experience over a long period of time. And in a way, that psalm that Sandra read for us is another passage that you could sit down and spend a huge amount of time contemplating the significance of the words that David delivers. It's part of its majesty and its beauty. It's a picture of the blessings that God provides. Those green pastures being with us in death's dark veil. And my favourite line is where it says, my cup overflows in response to something of what we have known and discovered. The picture that's painted in the psalm and in the gospel is of an intimate, close relationship. A shepherd who doesn't just see a crowd, but is aware of the various characters within that mass that he is asked to look after, to guide, to care for. A good shepherd has a depth of relationship. And I suppose these images ask us how willing we are to open ourselves to God. Warts and all, how willing we are to be frank and honest with the God who brought us to be about who we are, what our struggles are, what our battles are, what our hopes and our aspirations are. Whether we are prepared to make ourselves vulnerable in a way that the shepherd who lies across the gate, the sheepfold, makes himself vulnerable as well. The picture of the shepherd that's delivered is a man who is compassionate, available, reassuring. We need to remember that this is a Jesus who invites us into relationship with him and offers us the hope of the possibilities he brings. And then thirdly, Jesus says in relation to the sheep, I lay down my life only to take it up again. Yeah. One of the things that people out there, and some people within the church, struggle to get hold of is why people will give up perfectly good jobs and offer themselves to become a member of the clergy. Yeah. Andrew Webb, preparing to arrive, gave up what I assume is a good career as a nurse in order to train and be sent out to serve the church and he is on his way here. He gave up his life to become a man's dweller which is an interesting experience as any man's dwelling children will tell you. To become a figure in the community. To become someone who by wearing things like this makes evident who they are and something of what they stand for. And then I suppose having done that, he picked up his life again and now runs with it, not being a nurse, but with being a Methodist minister and, and responding to God's call in the midst of all that goes on. When Jesus says, I lay down my life, he's doing much more than laying down a career. It is one of these almost constant reminders that we find in the Gospels of Jesus looking forward to what was to be 
and painting a picture of the journey he was to undertake in the hope that his followers would understand. And the Gospel writers, in recording this, painting pictures they hope that we will grasp and sense their significance. The Jesus who was prepared to lay down his life for each one of us. And to ask ourselves in a way how we respond to this central tenant of the story that's the heart of our faith. The Jesus who, as the hymn reminds us, journeys through Gethsemane and Calvary all for our sakes, to overcome the law, to set us free, whatever language you might like to use. The Jesus who took the path of the shepherd in order to set his flock free. The Bible sometimes paints pictures of us as being enemies of God, which is a phrase we might find difficult. But I suppose what it's trying to say is that because we get it wrong, because we do things we know we shouldn't, we think thoughts we shouldn't, we do all those things in a sense hinder the outworking of God's purposes and Jesus came in a sense to lay, allow us to lay down that burden and to begin again, to appreciate the benefits of following the shepherd. To recognise what it is that Jesus has done for us and the huge risk that he and his Father in heaven took because we know how fickle we are. How easily we stray. How comfortable we are sometimes with getting it wrong. And Jesus, the shepherd who invites us back into the fold, and paints a picture of hope. So in a way, this is an invitation again to think about the, the reality of the cross, to think about the, the joy of resurrection, to ask ourselves what it is that we believe and why, I suppose, that should be a source of great celebration. To ask whether we really appreciate what it is to dwell in the sheepfold of which Jesus is the shepherd. One, as the, paint, as the passage paints it, of folds all over the place. A place to which others will be welcome. A place where we know when life is good, it will be great. When life is challenging, there will be hope. A place where even in the darkest times there is a banquet being prepared for those who live within the fold. If you've watched One Man and a Dog, you will know that your British sheep need to be brought in. They need a dog to get them to where they need to be. The Palestinian sheep just come because they hear the master's voice and know that where he is, there is safety. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he invites us to listen for his call. Come to where he is and know that where he is, life will be as good as it will be. But he will be there with us. And when we call, we know that he, like a good shepherd, will come looking for us, restore us and bring us back home to where we should be. It's a powerful image. I'll go back to my school teaching days and these journeys through London to watch plays and things in the theatre. And there were those who would stick with the person at the front, who in a sense were the good sheep and knew where they're going, and the ones at the back would tend to be wanting to sort of wander off, to look in shops, to pause, 
Fortunately, no mobile phones in those days. To walk very slowly, as I recall, and needed to be hurried along. We are a different community. We're all in different places on this journey. But we need to fix our vision on the shepherd who calls us and follow him to the safety of where he will bring us. Amen.